Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Life in Christ in the National Church. This is our Sunday School Hour. And I just wanted to take a moment to welcome you. And I pray that um, this lesson blesses your soul. Um, and, and so this morning we are in our last study in this segment that we're studying out of our Sunday School book. Next week, we're going to move into a different study. We're going to be talking about the prophets. So our segment of lessons next week will change. And so this morning, we are in our last study. And um, the lesson that we're going to be studying this morning is called to serve. So I'm really excited about this lesson. There's some really inspirational and insightful things that we're going to capture in our scripture on today. And I just pray that this lesson blesses your soul. As always, I like to take a few minutes just to briefly share about what this Sunday School Hour is designed for. I don't want us to, to think that uh, this Sunday School is designed to uh, supernaturally transform us into biblical scholars. That's not what this is about. This Sunday School Hour is designed to get into our hearts, get into our minds and into our souls, what the Bible teaches. And our prayer is that the Lord will continue to anoint us and endow us and, and, and reveal to us the fullness of who he is, the fullness of what his word says, so that we not only know it, but we become it, we do it, and then we share it with others. And so, as always, I always refer to um, our scripture, Isaiah 28 and 10, which tells us that um, uh, it must be precept upon precept. It must be precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little, there little. And that's our Isaiah 28, 10 verse, which means to me that there are no holes in God. God's spirit, God's nature, his character is whole, is complete. And when we go into God's word and we go into our Sunday school hour, we're reaching for the wholeness and fullness of God. And so that's what this is about. It's not designed to 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 transform us into what I call uh, uh, biblical lawyers where we argue our point to prove that we're right. It's not about that. It is so that the Lord can uh, equip us and, and enable us and endow us to do his divine will, to do the work of the Lord, to become all that God has designed and purposed for our lives. And so I pray that this study and the Sunday school hour will continue to bless you. It has truly uh, blessed my soul and continues to bless my soul. So I'm excited about what the Lord is doing in our Sunday school hour. And so I invite you um, to come along and, and um, be a part of this hour. It's really uh uh, inspirational it's very um and and educational uh lessons that the lord has provided for us and as already mentioned this is our last lesson in this segment next week we shift and we're going to start learning in our sunday school hour about the prophets and so that's going to be very exciting as well and so with that being said let us go ahead and open up with a word of prayer and father in the name of jesus we thank you lord god for our sunday school hour we thank you father for this time to be in your presence and to read your word and to study your word we thank you for our sunday school book we thank you for the resources we thank you for the lessons and the insight and the inspiration that it provides father we ask that you would have your way father in our sunday school lesson and our sunday school hour we honor you father for this time we bless you and we praise you in jesus name i do pray amen amen and amen and i thank god for that prayer and so what i like to do i like to briefly share and i think this kind of helps us out and this kind of gives us a roadmap as to where we are um what we're going to be dealing with this morning and then um where we're going so this is our lesson agenda this morning as i mentioned already our lesson it uh, this morning is called to serve so i'm excited about this title i'm excited about the insight and inspiration that comes from my study this morning and um, our devotional reading uh from from this past week is coming from psalms 33 1 through 12 and i'd like to to read that uh, with you before we go into our scripture reading this morning our background scripture for our um study this morning is coming from acts the 16th chapter verses 11 through 15 and then Acts the 16th chapter, verse 40. Then we'll be um, in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 26 through 30. 
Our lesson aims this morning is identify on a map the locations mentioned. And then our second lesson aim is to compare and contrast the roles of Paul and Lydia in planting the church in Philippi. And then our third lesson aim is to improve his or her or to improve our best area of service in the categories of in-reach, outreach, and upreach. So again, our scripture is Acts 16, verse 11 through 15, and verse 40. 1 Corinthians, first chapter, verse 26 through 30. We're going to go into our activity page as, as always. We're going to recap, and then we'll discuss a little bit about what next week's lesson is going to be about. I'll share our announcements with you as I do every Sunday morning, and then we will close in prayer. And so this is our lesson agenda. We all are on the same page. Amen. And uh, so let us go ahead and get into... Um, our key verse, our key verse is coming from Acts 16, um, and the actual, uh, give me just a minute, yeah, um, our key verse is coming from Acts 16, and um, I want to uh, make sure that we have, I was a little ahead of myself, I want to make sure that we have um, the right information, because as you all know, um, I'm slide challenged sometimes and the right information and the wrong information somehow tends to end up there. So we're reading our key verse, which is Acts 16, verse 15. Give me just a minute. So we're all on the same page. Our key verses come from Acts, the 16th chapter and the 15th verse. And it reads, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. And so... As we saw in our lesson aims, which actually gave us a clue as to who the she could possibly be, we learned that it could possibly be Lydia, and it is. And that's who we're going to be studying about this morning uh, in our Sunday School Hour as we learn um, from the Sunday School lesson about being called to serve. And so that's our key verse. Um, we already discussed what our lesson aims are. Uh, we're going to identify on the map the locations mentioned. We're going to compare and con contrast the roles of Paul and Lydia and planting the church in Philippi. And then we're going to talk about how we can improve our best area of service um, in inreach, outreach, and upreach. And so um, I'm excited about this. I think this um, helps us move into a place of divine purpose. Um, and, and it helps to, to solidify and and. Uh, revisit the things that the Lord has called you to do um, for him. And so um, in, in um, how you're shaped and, and um, so I'm excited about it. So we're going to go straight into our scripture reading. We're starting with Acts, the 16th chapter, verses 11 through 15. And so verse 11 reads, um, from Troas, we put out to sea. And sailed straight from Samothra Thrace. And the next day we went on to Neophilus. So I'm going to be working really hard to pronounce some of these words correctly. Uh, uh, because they're uh, Greek names and Greek uh, terminology. So I just ask that you bear with me. And what I like to do during our Sunday school hour, I like to read our, our, our Sunday school lesson. And then I also like to share uh, what the Lord reveals to me and what the Lord leads on my heart about that particular passage of scripture. And then we'll go into our Sunday school book and then we'll look and see what the Sunday school lesson reveals to us about uh, the word. And so 
what we're seeing here in verse 11, um, when we're talking about Apostle Paul, they're traveling um, from Choas, and, and they're sailing straight from what they call Samatha Thrace. Um, and then the next day they went on to Neapolis. So we have an idea that they're on a ship. We have an idea that they're sailing. And we have an idea that they are in Greece. So that takes us to verse 12. Verse 12 says, from there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. So we know that they traveled to Philippi, which is a Roman colony, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia. And they, they were there several days. Verse 13 says, on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. Verse 14, one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Leah, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Verse 15, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. And so what we're gleaning from these verses here is that Paul is... Uh, in Philippi, him and his team go to find a place of prayer on the Sabbath, and he begins to speak to some women who had gathered there um, outside the city gate to the river, is what the scripture says in verse 13. And here we see in, in these verses. Paul's introduction to Lydia, and and who is, who is a dealer of purple cloth, um, and a worshiper of God, and and the scripture says her heart was open, and in that she responded to Paul's message. And so, um, because of that, she was baptized, and the members of her household were baptized, and she was so moved and so impacted by the ministry of Paul, and so moved and so impacted by. The message that Paul administered, she invited them to stay at her house, and and um, her her and I, I really find her her invitation rich, and I say that because she says, "If you consider me a believer in the Lord," she said, "Come and stay at my house," and 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 um, and so uh, they were persuaded to go stay at her house. And so I, I can appreciate this because I feel like this encounter, um, this the scripture that we're reading really uh, comes close to home to us because it helps us understand that there are real conversations, there are real people, there are real interactions and real feelings here. Um, they're in Greece. Uh, uh, Paul is ministering to a different race of people. He's, he's Jewish. He's ministering to Greeks at this time. And, and then he introduces them. They get baptized. They accept the Lord uh, uh, Jesus as their Savior. And then, and then she says, if you really believe that um, I'm a believer, come to my home. And so I appreciate that. I really appreciate that lesson. And, and that, that stuck with me and that sticks with me. So what I want to do is real briefly, I want to share what the Sunday School lesson um reveals to us about about these verses and um so here we see that paul and his companions the sunday school book says began their second missionary journey and it was about 8052 it began with revisits to some of the cities paul had visited on his first journey paul had a vision of a man of macedonia who entreated him to come over to Macedonia and help. The vision served as a warrant for Paul to cross the Aegean Sea and enter Europe with the gospel. His first time to do so. 
Paul's initial visit to the city of Philippi and Corinth both occurred during this trip. The city of Philippi sat in a commanding position on the fertile plain of the Gangites River. So when we read in the verbs about the river, they were actually talking about the Gangites River. It was surrounded by mountains on three sides. Its site is in the northern quadrant of the modern Greece, about 400 years old. And when visited by Paul, Philippi was a major Macedonian city. Um, Philippi's name came from the King Philippi II of Macedon, who conquered the city in 356 BC and renamed it for himself. That was one of the first steps in Philippi's domination of the entire Greek peninsula. It set the stage for his successor and son, Alexander the Great, to march east and conquer territories all the way to India. The gold mines for which the city of Philippi was known provided great wealth for both leaders to fund their military campaigns. But the Apostle Paul was in search of gold of a different kind, and he found it. And so that's what a Sunday School lesson opens up sharing with us about what we're reading about this morning in our scripture. We're in Greece, we're reading about Lydia, we're reading about Paul's second ministry, um, we're reading about the Gangites River and uh, the city of uh, Philippi in Macedonia and what that city represent, represented at that time. And so let's take a look at our verses 11 through 15. Um, so we're, the Sunday School lesson is sharing with us, Troas was a major seaport on the eastern shore of the Aegean Sea. There, Paul, Silas, and others were joined by Luke, um, for they um, of Acts 16, 8 shares, um, when they say we, they're talking about, talking about them. These missionaries boarded a ship for Macedonia, uh, going way by the small inland of Samoa Thrace to the western Aegean part, port city, Neophilus. From Choas to Neophilus was about 150 miles, which they sailed in two days. And so that's good to know. So when we read verse 11, we have a better understanding. We have a good insight about how far Choas is from Neophilus, uh, what what Samal Thrace is. Um, so so that that's really good. And the Sunday school lesson teaches us about this. And so verse, verse 12, Neapolis served as a seaport to the important city of Philippi. The journey between the two cities were about nine miles. In 168 BC, the city became a Roman colony, a place where veteran soldiers would retire and receive a tract of land to farm. Philippi was the easternmost point of the Via Ignatia, the great Roman highway of about 535 miles in length and crossed the Greek peninsula. Um, Philippi appeared to be a good city for the missionaries' task, for they decided to stay several days. And that's what verse 12 reveals to us. And so now we know um, about the Via Ignatia, which was a highway, the major highway. Uh, we know about Philippi. We know about the district of Macedonia. And so these are... Um, these are really good insights. So we feel like we're we're there. We we can actually um, make a map in our mind of where things are, and what things look like. And so that takes us to verse thirteen. Paul usually, um, Paul's usual strategy, excuse me, was to visit the city synagogue on the Sabbath to teach fellow Jews about Jesus. Tradition required that a community have. 10 married Jewish men to have a synagogue. But that number seems to have been unavailable in this overwhelming Gentile city. Instead, a group met outside the city gates by the river. 
This place could have been by the Gangites River, about a mile west of town, but this is uncertain. A place of prayer is a way of describing any synagogue. Since there was no synagogue there, the phrase suggests that those who gathered intended their meetings to be similar to those that occurred in synagogue. And that's important to be aware of, um, that uh, they didn't have the, the, the right amount of num number of folks, uh, but they met anyway. And um, they, 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 they built and established and designed and created a place of prayer. And um, they, they, they had their, 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 their worship there. And so this says, this prayer group seems to have consisted solely of women. In addition to that demographic, Paul would have encountered them in terms of one of three religious persuasions, a Jew as converted to Ju Judaism or a God-fearing Gentile who had not converted to Ju Judaism. The third category is most likely given the nature of the city of Philippi, Paul's willingness to minister to a group of Gentile women echoed Jesus's own ministry at Jacob's well. And so I thought that was important to share um, in our Sunday school lesson. So we know that um, Paul is not ministering to or reaching out to um, his own kind. He is actually going um, into an environment where, uh, as, as our Sunday school lesson tells us, it's a Gentiles reaching to, to learn more about Jesus. And so that's a blessing. And that's what um, being called to serve does. That's what being called to serve is. You oftentimes go outside of your comfort zone to reach those that don't look like you, that don't sound like you, that don't act like you, but they're hungering and thirsting for the word of God. And so that's what... Um, our lesson is ministering to us this morning. So verse 14 through 15 and verse 40, it says, interestingly, the women, specifically named Lydia, um, bears the ancient name of the kingdom of Lydia, which existed 1200 to 546 BC. It encompassed roughly the western half of the modern country of Turkey. So I thought that was really insightful. So the woman Lydia was named after the area within which her town of Thyatria was located, an area from which Paul had just come after having received a vision in which a man of Macedonia had invited him to come over. And so sometimes the Lord uh, moves in that way when he wants you to reach uh a nation of people when he wants you to reach a single person a single soul and Lydia was that single soul he will call you out of where you are to go to where God designed and purpose for you and so in Paul's data Sunday school lesson says Thyatira was the chief source of dyed fabric the woman Lydia specialized in pur purple cloth this particular work was difficult but profitable for those with this skill. To sell purple cloth was to deal in luxury items, kind of like our Gucci and our, our uh, Louis Vuitton. And so um, it is likely that Lydia uh, had prosperous business connections in her hometown and sold products in far-flung cities like Philippi. Like the Gentile Cornelius, Lydia was a worshiper of God and may have been drawn to the Jewish faith without converting to it. Many barriers existed against full inclusion with the Jewish people, but Luke regularly recognized the faithfulness of those people who, like Lydia, worshiped and feared God and were otherwise devoted. As Paul encountered such a one here, he would again. Surely Lydia's 
prior worship of God had prepared her heart to hear Paul's message. The Sunday school lesson says, the Lord, not Paul or his rhetoric, then opened her heart to Paul's presentation of the gospel. I had to um, highlight that and reread that for us this morning. The Lord, not Paul or his rhetoric, then opened her heart to Paul's presentation of the gospel. I love that because it's not about us. It's about the Lord. God had gone before his missionary and God will continue after his missionary finishes. The Sunday school lesson says, and Paul will later write to the Corinthians. One person might plant a seed and another might water, but God has been making it grow. First Corinthians three, six. That's one of my favorite verses because, um, we can reach, we can pray, we can do, we can surrender, we can sacrifice. And all of those efforts, God is the one who brings the magnification. And so um, that's important to remember as we are diligent and faithful in the things of God and in the work of the Lord. And so verse 15, Lydia responded to Paul's message with faith. We can imagine that Lydia and her household were baptized right there at the river without delay as an outflowing of gratitude to god for accepting her into his family lydia invited paul and his companions to her home to stay a while asking the men to judge whether she was a believe a, a believer in the lord reveals that this is also a test the sunday school lesson says would the jewish men visit the home of a Gentile woman. How included in God's kingdom was she really? By insisting that the missionaries join her, Lydia revealed her own conviction that she and all her household were now entirely acceptable to the Lord. Nothing was lacking in her salvation. I love that. And so that takes us to verse 40. While in Philippi, Paul and Silas were arrested for causing a spirit of divination out of a fortune-telling slave girl. Following the conversion of their guard and release from prison, Paul and Silas returned to Lydia's house. The unjust treatment of the missionaries was traumatic for them, and the new congregation this became a time for all to be encouraged. Lydia's home in Philippi surely became the initial meeting place for this group of believers. However, the book of Philippians, written a decade or so later, contains no reference to Lydia. So, however, as Paul celebrated the partnership, those of the church and maintained from the first day until now. And so, um, in uh, uh, chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, verse 25 through um, 39, I call it the praying church. The church was praying, and because the church was praying, the prison doors were open. And the scripture is telling us that Paul and Silas um, went to the house church, and, and that house church in Philippi was actually Lydia's house. And so we can see the, I believe, the divine connection in um, Lydia's accepting the Lord uh, Jesus as her Lord and Savior. We can see the connection between her inviting the men of God to her home and then later that home becoming a house church and so and also a house of refuge. And so we thank God for that um, insight. We thank God for that. And so that takes us to our next uh set of scriptures and I want to read Acts 16 verse 40 so that we know um, what the scripture says specifically about that verse. So Acts 16 verse 40 says, after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with their brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. And so this is telling us that that one meeting after Lydia's conversion, inviting the men of God to her home, turned her home into a house church. And I praise and, and, and honor God for that. 
And so um, it, it really just uh, hits the nail on the head when our Sunday school lesson reads, nothing was lacking in her salvation. And we all want to get there. We all want to be there. We don't want nothing, absolutely nothing lacking in our salvation. We don't want to miss it. And so um, that's why we have our Sunday school hour. That's why we're reading from our Sunday school book. That's why we're, we're studying and reading God's word. And we're working <clears throat> day and night, every moment, every second of the day to be more, to do more, to become what the word of God says. And so we're, we're grateful and thankful uh, to God for that. We're thankful for this insight. We're thankful for this lesson that the Lord would allow us to, to learn this and to read this Um and so that takes us to our next set of verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 30. And verse 26 reads, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. Verse 27 but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Verse 28, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Verse 29, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. And so this, I believe, is kind of like the culmination of Paul's ministry and, and the message to our study this morning, Call to Serve. Uh, this is telling us that in so many words, it's not about us. And, and for us to even try to put ourselves before who God is and what God is doing through us. Um, it, it's, 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 a, it's, it, it's a check. It's a, it's a humanity check. And so verse 26 is saying that, um, remember, all we have to do is just remember who we were before God called us. And, and that's humbling because if it wasn't for God, we would not be saved. If it wasn't for God, we would not be here. And um, it wasn't that that we were saved because of our wisdom. And, and it, it wasn't that um, it, it wasn't because we were influential or, or because of our noble birth. But the grace of God, the, 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 the spirit of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord allowed us to be chosen. It allowed us to 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 um come to the realization and understanding that God is real and and that we want to serve him with with our whole heart. And so verse 27 says um and this I think this is important. This this verse I believe is is quoted often, but but this verse right now in context reveals that uh we do what we do for the Lord. We become who we become for the Lord. Uh, because it was all a part of God's divine plan. And, and this verse tells us that God took the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, recognizing that your little itty bitty wisdom is of no magnitude in regards to God's wisdom. So there's no reason to boast or to, to become pompous or, or act all built up. And, and the other thing this verse says is that the weak things of the world were used to say, shame the strong. And so um, we often hear, you know, that the Lord uses um, those who, who are not the most favored. The Lord uses those who are not the richest. You know, but he goes for the weak. He goes for the poor. And that's what this verse is revealing to us, that, that the Lord um, is out to fully reveal who he is um, in, in every aspect, in every way. And so verse 28 says, um, God chose the lowly things of the world um, um, and the despised things of the world um, to nullify uh, 
the things that we we uh, lord over. You know, we get excited about nice cars. We get excited about uh, nice houses and 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 a whole lot of money in the bank and all of those things. The Lord is saying, I nullify that with who I am. All of that stuff will fade away, but heaven and earth. Um, and so, and so, it's important for us to to have a, a what I call a resolve. It's important for us to to um, be resolute uh, with with where we stand in the things of God, and not get caught up or get tricked by uh, the things of this world. And so, if nothing else, make sure that you hold on to God and you hold on to the things of God and not to the things of this world. Um, and so. Um, let's uh, take a look at what uh, verse 29 says. So no one may boast before him. And and I, I love that verse because it reminds us that we can win a, a number of victories. We can um, conquer the world. We can create and accomplish brain surgery. We can create uh, an internet. We can fly to the moon and come back. But this verse is reminding us that we're not doing that in our strength. The Lord has graced us and we're able to do that because of God. So the importance of humility, the importance of having a resolve about who God is and who we are in God, knowing that it doesn't come from us, but every ounce of it comes from a merciful and gracious God. So that's important to hold on to even in, in our work and, and even in, in our, our, our talents and our skill levels and our businesses and all those things, all glory and all honor fully and completely goes to God. And so that takes us to verse 30. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus um, and uh, who has become for us wisdom from God. I. The, the scripture says it all. It, it it needs no no explanation. That is our righteousness. That is our holiness. That is our redemption. And so it goes back to first one. We're saved because God called us. We're saved because that was God's divine will and purpose. We had nothing to do with it. And so we we honor God for that. We bless God for that. So let's take a look. Let's see what our Sunday school lesson shares. We're going to go ahead and read that. So we're looking at verse 26 through 30, and it says here, Paul had planted the church in Corinth in about AD 52. Now in about AD 56, he writes a letter to that church while ministering in Ephesus. The letter is in response to troubling efforts of factions and disunity. And you'll find that in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 11. Paul reminded the Corinthian Christians of what they had been before coming to Christ. Their church did not begin with leaders who had great education, widespread social influence, or distinguished families. Doubly, Paul may have wanted to remind the Corinthians that their mostly Gentile backgrounds had prevented them from attaining any standing among God's people before. And so, so that, that gives great insight about who Paul is ministering to and, and why he had to remind them of, 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 uh, of uh, what the Lord had done for them and what the Lord was doing for them. And so, um, Regarding their being wise by, by human standards, Paul was well acquainted with those dangers. He, he himself was able to quote Greek philosophers and, and, and Greek scholars. And, and while recognizing the overall defects in philosophies not grounded in scripture, and I want us to hold on to that because a lot of times we can pick up some things and, and swear by them. But if it's not grounded in scripture, if it doesn't come from the word of God, it will fade. It will falter. And and um and so that's important to, to be fully aware of. And so that takes us to verse 27 through 29. Paul sees the great irony in all of us. All human wisdom and power are finite things. And we know that. We know that. Um, they're, they're minuscule when compared to the power and wisdom of God. That goes without 
saying, I believe. <clears throat> but God doesn't often choose to dazzle people. Um, the Sunday school lesson reads, in belief by displays of might and intelligence. God prefers to use the foolish and weak things of the world to communicate his loving concern and his plan for humankind. And that's important to, to hold on to. God knows that he can crush us with his pinky finger or he could blow and, and destroy us because we're weak and we're feeble. But he doesn't do that. What he does is he provides goodness. What he does is he provides his spirit. What he does is he provides his son to hang on a cross and die for us. And so we serve a, a merciful God. And I'm thankful for that this morning. And so verse 28 says um, in the Sunday school lesson, the word translated lowly is the antonym of the word noble literally ignoble in the roman world there was nothing more ignoble than a cross the torture execution for the worst criminals it was especially problematic to jews because of the curse of hanging on a pole and that's in deuteronomy 21 verse 23. christians today the sunday school lesson reads see the cross as a comforting and victorious symbol. Churches display it. We wear it on necklaces and other jewelry. We even tattoo it on our bodies. Not so in Paul's day. And I think that's important to understand and to respect and to know different culture, different people, different time. The cross was shameful. Nothing could be more despised among polite society. But God does not play by society's rules and expectations. A Christian seeing a cross in the first century would be struck by the completely unexpected and humbling circumstances of Jesus' sacrifice. What is scandalous for us may be glorious for God. And so that takes us to verse 29. God upside down plan ensures that no one can claim credit for their own salvation. I want to read that again. God's upside down plan ensures that no one can claim credit for their own salvation. And, and, and rightly so, if we claimed credit for our own salvation, then our own salvation would be useless. And so, um, um, th that's reasonable. That's very reasonable. The Sunday school lesson says the, the Corinthians prided themselves as discerning, intelligent people. They could be impressed by a well-reasoned speech of no substance. But Paul had instead presented a message of the utmost importance, the truth of the gospel, not human skill, not convinced of the Corinthian Christians. And so that's important to understand that the truth of the gospel it has nothing to do with human skill. Um, and so because of that, I believe it convinced the Corinthian Christians. And so we thank God for that. And so that takes us to our last verse, verse 30. God's wisdom, unlike the world's, find fulfillment in Christ Jesus. Righteousness invokes a legal term that means even though we are guilty of our sin, no penalty is the sentence. The prophets often took this word further, defining it not in terms of a lack of wrong actions, but as the presence of right actions. And so the Holy Spirit works holiness in us. The Holy Spirit, I have to read that again from our Sunday school lesson. It says the Holy Spirit works holiness in us, reaching us, excuse me, teaching us to identify sin and empowering us to overcome it and produce the fruit of the spirit. This allows us to live holy lives that would be impossible without God's power. Romans 8 verses 1 through 16. Redemption is a term associated with being freed from slavery. In the Roman Empire, a slave could purchase his or her own freedom, but sinners have no way to pay for our own freedom. We have not only been bought by the blood of Jesus, we have been set free from our slavery to sin. Amen, hallelujah, and thank you, Jesus. Put together, 
Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption describe the reality of being in Christ. Through the cross, God has made a way for us to be restored to fellowship with him. This is our salvation in Jesus Christ. And so that takes care of um, our scripture reading this morning and what the Sunday School Lesson book reads to us about um, our scripture reading. And it was some very insightful and wonderful lessons that we learned this morning. And so um, what I wanted to do this morning is um, go into just a few conclusive uh, points that our Sunday School Lesson shares with us. And so um, our Sunday School Lesson concludes by telling us that of course, the last four weeks, we've been exposed to um, examples. Um, we, we had an example of Anna, we, uh, the prophetess, the daughters of, of Philip, uh, the Samaritan woman. We had an example of Mary Magdalene and Priscilla. And in Lydia's case, the Sunday School book reads, she made use of her status and wealth to serve God. Um, her prosperous business allowed her to host Paul and his companions in her house, as well as the church that would grow from their efforts. And so these efforts were not accomplished for the glory of Lydia or Paul. And that's important to remember. Both sought only to follow Christ and lead others to Christ. And so we might summarize the account from this unit and say that each woman served where God gave her opportunity and gifting. While the same is true for men, the nature of women's ministries have often been less visible and sometimes considered less critical in spreading the gospel. And so, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, God chose the cross to show his wisdom instead of using what was already honored and revered in human society. And so let us all continue to seek his wisdom and remain open to other foolish things that God may choose in place of the wise. And this way we seek only God and God's glory. And so that is our Sunday School lesson. That ends our segment talking about being called. Next week, we go into a new segment. We go into a new study. We go into our spring uh, Sunday school section of our, our Sunday school book and we will be discussing prophets faithful to God's covenant so I'm excited about that and what I want to do I want to as always take a few minutes to share um, some photos that I've taken the liberty to capture from our lesson so this gives us um, a depiction of the city of Philippi we see that um, we, on the map, we can see that Philippi is close to Neapolis. We can see that Philippi is in Macedonia. And then you have the other uh, Greek cities that are there. We see the Aegean Sea that we read about. And then up at the top, um, when we talked about Lydia and where Lydia was from, we see that she was from Thy uh, Thyatira, um, excuse my pronunciation. And so we kind of get an idea where Thyatira is and where it's located in um, relation to the Aegean Sea and, and the, the city of Ephesus and, and, and of course, um, the other seven churches that will be later mentioned in Revelations. And then we talked about the Via Ignitia. We talked about the the major highway that, that, that um, uh, went through uh, the, the uh, peninsula of Greece. And so here on this map, we can see the Via Ignitia and, and how it's running through um, Philippi, how it's running through the major city. And so I wanted just to take uh, some time to, to give you uh, some what I call eye candy. So you can physically see on a map, you can see where Philippi is, you can see where Thyatira is. You can see what where the big Nisha was located and those kinds of things. I pray that these photos bless you. And so that takes us into our um, activity page. For the sake of time, I'm trying not to go over. We are in lesson 13. And so um, the title of our lesson is called to serve. I'm going to go straight to the answer sheet. 
So um, part one of our activity page is church planting. And this activity portion of the activity page is asking us, what would your key responsibilities be? And it's saying, and it's wanting us to list top 10 things to get done. And then what your own personal responsibilities would be. And so what I want to do, I want to encourage you to take some time during the week. And I want you to make your list. You know what the Lord has called you to do. You know how your shape, you know how your schedule is. What would your 10 things be? Your 10 things are definitely going to be different from my 10 things. And then your responsibilities are definitely going to be different from my responsibilities. So what I did, I made a list, a personal list for my responsibilities. So let us go to that. Um, and then the second part of activity is places of transition. And I love doing word search. And so what uh, a second portion of our activity page is calling us to do, find seven places associated with Paul's travel in today's text. And so we're going to do that. We have the answers for that. I have the answers uh, to that for you. And so my answers for church planting, my answers for call to serve, what would uh, be my key responsibilities? So the legal name of the church and taking care of all of the documentation that goes along with establishing um, a church on the government and on the state level, um, building and praying uh, for the, the organization and, and taking care of all of the, 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 the administration or overseeing all the administration that is required in order uh, to, to maintain uh, the church, uh, casting the vision and identifying the mission for the church, identifying a location for the church, identifying the staff that, that, uh, the Lord has called, the Lord has sent to come alongside, uh, to, to, to fulfill the call and the destiny in which God has purposed, identifying the services. Right now we have, uh, three, uh, solid services that we offer. We have our Sunday school hour, we have our end of month service, and then we have our, our midweek Bible study. And then the preaching that is required, the teaching that is required, the training of our ministers and of our staff that is required, the prayer that that, that goes into all of that. And then funding. Uh, as I mentioned uh, a couple of uh, Sunday school lessons ago, uh, ministry uh, costs, everything costs. And so when you look at my responsibilities, I'm responsible for all of it. But the Lord has sent those. The Lord has sent the supporters. The Lord has sent those who pray. And, and that, that helps lift the burden. That helps make uh, this assignment, this task that the Lord has me on that much easier. And I'm grateful to God for that. And so I want you, I encourage you, you fill out your list. What, what things look like for you um, and how you honor and how you glorify God um, and, and what he's called you to do. And so um, that takes us to part two. And here are the answers. Um, Corinth, Macedonia, Neapolis, Philippi, Samothracia, uh, Thyatira, and Troas. And forgive me for, for butchering the, trans <laughs> the, the, the pronunciation of those words. Um, but here's the answers for that. We were able to find the seven places associated with Paul's travel. And so I pray that these activities encourage you and they bless you. And that takes us to our recap. We were able to identify on the map the locations mentioned in our, our Bible uh, reading this morning. We were able to compare and contrast the worlds of Paul and Lydia in planting the church in Philippi. And, and real briefly, uh, Lydia believed the Lord. She accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. She invited Paul and, and, and his uh, team to her home. And then her home ended up becoming the house church in Philippi. And so when we talk about the compare and contrast roles of Paul and Lydia, it is, as the scripture says, some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. And we honor and we thank God for that. And so the last one, improve in our best area of service in the categories of in-reach, outreach, and upreach. In-reach, of course, is inside. Outreach, of course, is those that the Lord send you to, min 
uh, send you to minister to and uproot is your worship and your own personal time with the Lord. And so um, we haven't arrived yet. None of us, pastor, preacher, teacher, evangelist, prophet, none of us have arrived. We have not arrived, and I always say this, not until the Lord say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And so every moment, every second of the day, we work and we strive to get it right. And so we continue to press forward in the things of God. We continue to allow the Lord to use us. And each day we grow, and each day we get better, and, and each day the Lord add on. And so we know the scripture says some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. And we thank God for that. And so that takes us into next week, what we're going to be studying next week. My apologies, I am going a little bit over. Um, next week, we move, as I already mentioned, into a different set of studies. We're, next week, we're going to be studying about profit of deliverance. So our devotional reading this week is Psalm 77, verses 11 through 20. Our background scripture is coming from Exodus the 12th chapter, verses 28 through 50. Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, verses 15 through 22. And our key verse is Deuteronomy 18, 15. And that key verse reads, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And so that is what we will be studying next week in our Sunday school hour. Be blessed of the Lord. Um, and uh, get your, your Sunday school study done, get your lessons done. As always, we have a midweek Bible study every Thursday evening at 7.30 p.m. In March, we're going to have our end of month message. It's going to be Sunday, March 21st at 11.30 a.m. Click the Zoom, be a part, join, and then the end of the month, uh, we will do our minister's training. It's going to be on Saturday. It's an eight-week session. And it starts Saturday, March 27th at 10 a.m. Eastern. That's also another Zoom meeting. And uh, with that being said, if there's nothing else, we're going to go ahead and close out with a word of prayer. Thanks for being a part of our Sunday School Hour. Thanks for being a part of this lesson. I pray that this lesson ministered to you even well after we leave from our Sunday School Hour. And that the Lord will continue to grow your faith in Him and grow your ministry and grow what the Lord has called you to do. And we thank God for these segments where we've learned about being called to explain, being called to serve, being called to testify, and all of the facets of, of what it means to, to honor God with our life wholeheartedly. And so with that being said, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for our Sunday school hour. We thank you for the lesson that we studied on this morning called to serve. We thank you for the life and the, the example of Lydia showing that she used her resources and and her household and her household became the house church. We honor you for that, Lord. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to have your way in our lives. Father, we recognize, Lord God, that this time is designed and purposed for you, that you would indeed allow us to operate and flow in precept upon precept and line upon line. And that you would indeed would, would allow us, oh dear God, to, to get into our hearts, into our mind, into our souls, sound biblical doctrine and sound Christian theology. And we honor you for it. We honor you for this time. And Father, as we leave, Father, from this place, but never, ever from your presence, continue to be with us. Continue to go before us in all things. We love you, Lord. We honor you and we bless you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you all. Thanks for being a part of our Sunday School Hour. You all have a blessed week. And I will reconnect with you all on Thursday during our midweek Bible study hour. Um, and during that hour, we're actually going to be shifting to a different uh, study. It's going to be interesting. We're going to be talking about spring this month. Spring up, spring forth, springs of water. We're excited about what the Lord is going to minister to us. You all have a blessed day rest of the day. We'll see you on Thursday.